So it's been a pleasure getting to know Dan and Sharon and the passion that they have for God's truths and seeing the example that they both set for all believers in terms of not only using their talents, which are many, but learning the talents that they see needed. Sharon was sharing that she learned how to do all this video stuff and camera. She didn't learn it when she was 16, but she learned it when she said, this is what we need to do. So it doesn't matter how old you are, if you're young or you're old, wherever God's leading you, do that. And look to their example and, uh, you ready? Thank you, Tracy, very much. And all of you, how exciting. This is, uh, Actually, I have uh, seen a building interest and excitement in all the things that are going on here, and uh, uh, I've been contacted. I know there's some other folks that will be coming in tomorrow, so this is just too good, too wonderful. And if I may join in with Pastor Mark, welcoming you to our home. So it's great to have you here. I appreciate all of you very much, and uh, so happy we're here. We're going to have a good time. I thought uh, I might talk with you for a couple of minutes tonight about what I guess I would call the bigger picture, the big picture. Uh, when we're talking about missions and outreach, uh, I think it's easy for us to do what we will do in, in these sessions here, and that is we look at the particulars and we look at strategies and we look at what seems to work and we look at ways to approach these various matters of outreach, and we should, and all that's wonderful and important. But I think that sometimes we get kind of too lost in all the particulars, all the details, before we get the big picture in our minds. And so I thought I might talk a little bit about the big, why are we here? What's this all about? Why are we doing this missions business? And I think so many times we're trudging along and we're working in things, doing good things, mind you, but we don't always have a good, crisp, clear picture in mind as to why we're doing it. What's it all about? What's going on here? So why are we doing missions? Why are we doing outreach? And I think it's it's easy for us to say, as we should, well, the Bible tells us to. Well, good, and, you know, that, and it does, very much so. We should be doing this. Uh, you could get a little closer to it and say, well, it, it is the Great Commission, and it is. And, and the Bible says that, and Jesus said that. I guess what I'd like to do just for a few minutes is press us just a little bit further and say, why? Why does the Bible tell us to do this? Why does Jesus tell us that? And why do we call this the Great Commission? What's it? Why? Why, we could press it a step further and just say, why didn't it all end when Jesus raised from the dead and when he ascended up on high, was taken up into heaven? What, why didn't it all end then? Why didn't it all just stop right there? Why did it go on? Why did it continue? And that then brings us to that question, why are we here? And what are we doing right now? And I think that it's easy for us to, to look at what we're doing sometimes without a good clear picture of why we're here doing it, why this works. So I thought we might take a, a, a look at this from a little different perspective and maybe it'll energize us some. It does me, as I was thinking about this earlier this afternoon, and I just began to think, wow, uh, I need to think about this more. And uh, why, why am I sometimes wrestling, looking to reach out to people? Why am I sometimes being looked at unhappily by people because you're reaching out to them actually with good things and yet they're not always pleased with that? But why are we going through all this? Why are we doing it? And uh, I thought Jesus gave a great picture of that that answers a lot of this for us, I think, from his perspective. Why he made this the, the Great Commission. Why it didn't end back when he ascended up on high, was taken up on high. So let me give you this parable. I think it just displays for us 
a picture that may be helpful to us uh, and give us a cleaner, clearer motivation, a greater incentive. So in Matthew 22 and 1, once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, okay, saying, the kingdom of heaven, verse 2, may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. Okay. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Wow. So again, he sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, look, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have, have been slaughtered. And everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. Wow, that's tremendous. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, his slaves, mistreated them and killed them. Let's stop just for a moment and see what we're seeing here. What is Jesus saying? He's saying the kingdom is like this. It's like a king. And I think in this case, he's talking about the kingdom and, and its entrance and how people are going to be coming into it and becoming a part of it. But he said, it's like a king and he was going to have a great feast, if you will, festival, if you will, for his son who was, who was marrying. And so he said, wow, this is going to be great. I'm going to bring all my friends in, all the good folks are going to come in. It's going to be wonderful. And I'm going to just have a great time in honor of my son and his wedding. So this is tremendous. Well, it's interesting then that there were a lot of people unhappy about this. They, they didn't come. They wouldn't come. They were busy pursuing whatever it was that was important to them. And uh, so they had business. They had farms. They had all these things going on. And they just refused to come. And then there were others who really were pretty awful people. And they actually seized the servants who were bringing the message and killed them, mistreated them, killed them. Oh my goodness. So here's a picture then of people who are being invited to this tremendous affair, if you will, and they won't go, don't appreciate it, don't appreciate it at all, and even seize the messengers who are bringing them this, this invitation and mistreat them and even kill them. Wow. Okay. We're talking about why we do this. Why are we here and why are we doing this? Reaching out and taking the message out and, and bringing it to people. I think we've got some pretty good in, indications here that not everybody's going to enjoy hearing what we have to say when we're inviting them to a great thing, a good thing in God, and yet they're not going to like it. The guys taking the message out really get beat up here, if you notice, even killed. So it's not always a happy event, right? Pastor Mark has said that Jesus really didn't know how to, to do a good altar call. He was, uh, he was telling his disciples, come and follow me, take up your cross. Hey, yeah, people can't wait for that, can they? So this is a potentially take up your cross kind of business we're in. Isn't that interesting? Oh, it's wonderful. Don't misunderstand me. Uh, and it was for them too. They had great joy and wonderful. My goodness, God was with them. Jesus was so pleased with what they were doing and, and will be with us too if we if we take a stand, and we are, by his grace, going to do that. But I think, again, a lot of times we are foggy about, well, why are we doing this then? People are not liking us for it, uh, and uh, it doesn't go well a lot of times, and so on. Well, a common answer is, well, 
You don't want to see people go to hell and, 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 and be tortured forever. Okay. So if that's, that's the motivation of some out here, I think. But actually, I don't think that's probably a good motivation. It wasn't Paul's. Uh, I read Paul carefully. And Paul really convinced me in all of his letters, all of his writings, that he was not teaching or talking about a running away from hell message. Read Paul and see what you think. That, that wasn't what it was all about. But actually, there is a negative that we want to be aware of as we're approaching people. And there is something worth fighting for there. And that Paul, Paul himself does say it in uh, Romans 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is eternal conscious torment. Well, no, wait a minute. What, is the, what are the wages of sin? Death. That's enough. That was the penalty that was announced in the garden to Adam and Eve, death. Okay. And, and that's horrible. Death is awful. And eternal death is a, uh, is a terrible thing for us to, to eschew, to get away from, and to seek that others would not experience that. Okay. But even still, I think there's something better here than running from any negative, in, including death even. I, I think we can get a better picture of a very positive thing so that our work is actually uh, for a very positive reason, if you will. We are about the business of coming into the banquet. We're about the business of coming into the banquet hall. We're about the business of coming into the kingdom of God where we will be his friends, his guests, people honored by God himself. That's the positive. And if you want to follow Paul, really follow him in all this business, that was his motivation over and over and over again. Let's go. You know, I'm putting everything behind that's behind and I'm moving forward because I want to apprehend this resurrection and I want to go forward in this. Yeah. So there's a positive, powerful, positive reason why we're inviting people. And it's interesting, I think, the example we're reading here. Jesus talks about all those who wouldn't have it. Even in that circumstance, uh, he mistreated them and he killed, they killed him, them, the slaves. So if you will read verse 7, if you'll bring us to 7. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Ah, okay. But even here, notice still, he doesn't say, take these murderers and torture them forever in unending conscious torment. Huh. We're on the right side of this issue, folks. We're not wrong about this. Wow. But anyway, uh, and uh, what? He burned their city. He didn't burn it forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. He burned it down. What do you think? Okay. Yet this is something that, that we want to see people escape. We want to escape it ourselves. And yeah, we do want to move from that negative. But look at the positive. That's what it's really about. We can have a part in this amazing kingdom of God business. What an honor. What a blessing it is for us all. So even my point about the not running from eternal conscious torment business, it's even here in this example, isn't it? Actually, once you begin to understand it correctly, it's everywhere. Okay. All right. So if we will, back to uh, verse 7 then. The king was enraged, and what he did was... Uh, he sent his troops, he destroyed those murderers, burned their city, and then in verse 8, he didn't stop. Notice what he does. Then he said to his slaves, his servants, the wedding is ready, but those invited, they're not worthy. He's got that one figured out. He, he's not going to lament and say, oh my goodness, I, I can't believe my friends are not coming and the people that I invited. They, no, he says, they're not worthy. Forget that. Verse 10. 
Those slaves then went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Wow. So we're probably going to stop there. Luke gives us uh, another parable that Jesus gave, which is very similar to this one. And in the one that uh, Luke talks about, it uh, follows a similar pattern. It comes down to uh, the master of the house in that case saying, you know, I want my wedding hall to be filled. Hmm. Now, in those words, I think, we find the answer to several of the questions that we started out asking. One, why didn't it just end when Jesus was taken up into heaven? Why aren't we looking back, and it was all over 2,000 years ago as far as that, all that business was concerned, right? No. I take it that in God's mind, in God's plan, in God's will, he wasn't ready. His banquet hall is not filled to his pleasure yet. Who gets to decide when it's full? He does. Who gets to say, that's enough? He does. Who knows about that? He does. Only he knows. But we do get the picture here of what it is that he's about. It's not some arbitrary thing even necessarily related to some prophecy, and that's okay, and that may be true too. You can figure it that way. But the real motivation of God is he's filling up a banquet hall. And we find ourselves twice, I think, in this beautiful story. One, we are people who've been invited into that wedding feast, if you will. We are people who've been invited to come and join the king as his honored guests. That's me, that's you, and all who will love and receive and accept his word. But guess what? Until the king, the master says it's enough, we're also the ones going out and going about the business of getting people to come on in. Do you see where we're at? Jesus did not complete the work yet, back when he was taken up on high. It wasn't time yet. Jesus knew it wasn't time. He said, I don't know when the time's going to be exactly. He said, the Father's got that in his hand. I don't know that it's so arbitrary in one sense. I think the Father has a plan. He's going to fill it up, fill up his kingdom. He's going to fill up those uh, who will come and join him in this great venture and love it and enjoy it and, and be worthy, unlike these that are described here. They're not worthy. Wow. So what are we doing here? We have come to be a part of this program. We've come to be a part of this kingdom. We've come to enjoy the pleasure of being favored by God himself because of his son. You realize it's his son is the reason he's called us, right? Well, all sorts of different pictures here that are going on, right? But actually, we're also very much given the task, the mission, of helping God to fulfill his purpose of filling up this kingdom until he says, enough, I'm done. Our mission runs till then. When that time comes, I think that's when you'll see everything changed and Christ will again be coming and there'll be a whole new episode of things going on. But our mission, that mission will be accomplished at that point. Yeah. So, wow. Here's what all this means to me, I think. When I get up in the morning, it is good to think about what can I do today that would help the message get out there? What can I do that will help the, the, the Word of God to be heard or read or somehow taken in by people, right? And uh, that would work to their advantage. What can I do? And I can begin to think about all the particulars and many of the good things that will be said here in these sessions. 
But as we think about all those things, think about this. Why are we doing this? It's not arbitrary. It's not just because the Bible said so, though that's a great reason. But there's a reason behind all of that. There's a reason why the Bible said so. Let's get that motivation going in our minds and in our hearts and realizing I'm going to invite people to a feast. I'm going to invite people to be a part of a favored gathering of people who God is so moved for and about because of their love for his son. You know, they hear the message and they say, oh, he's having a, a great get-together for his son. I wouldn't miss it for anything. Ha! Ah, those are the people he's looking for, right? Though that is what I think we want to keep in, keep, keep in mind in the mornings when we wake up. Yeah, think about how can I do this? How can I get the message? But never forget why we're getting that message out. And how important it is because we are a part of God's great scheme, God's great plan for humanity, for his kingdom, for his son. We're a part of that. And we're participants in it. We're a part of the program. We're a part of the plan. We're a part of what is making it happen. So what we're doing is important. Can you say amen? amen. Yeah. So let us realize as we go along, hey, we're inviting people to this feast. Who wouldn't want to come? Well, I don't know. We still run into some folks that don't want to. I don't know how that works. And will, will somebody get angry or upset? Well, they did back there. I guess they still might for us too. That's okay. Don't let it bother you. Just keep moving. But we're into a great, great work, a great, great mission. And I'm so thankful that God has counted us worthy to invite us and to entrust to us this great and wonderful matter of inviting others. Can you say amen? amen. Uh, the Lord bless you.